Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we're looking around the globe in 144 different nations looking for the thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we add two billion new people to the planet, so by 2050 it's estimated we'll have about nine billion souls, how are we going to be able to provide the food, the fuel, the fiber, the basic infrastructure that's needed for all these people? And of course, one of those things is how we're going to provide the food that actually increases the quality of life instead of just having people that exist. And as uh, developing nations, and particularly in Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific, become more affluent, uh, they're going to more and more animal proteins to enhance their diet. And so they're becoming bigger, stronger, faster at the same time is that we're uh, using much more uh, animal proteins, both uh, chickens, poultry of all kinds, and cattle. But we're going to be focused on the poultry because this is something that's universal around the globe and at the same time can uh, use less inputs to create the type of food that's needed. And I have sitting right beside me uh, someone who has uh, been with us before. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, Damon Walia. He is the president and CEO of Arctec Inc., uh, headquartered in Washington, D.C. And Dr. Walia, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Well, th thank you very much, Sam, for having me again. Glad to have you on. And we're going to bring up this first slide because uh, this will be um, an image of what we're going to be talking about. If we can uh, bring the uh, first slide up. And. Uh, what are we looking at here, and what does Arctech have to do with, you know, turkeys and chickens <laughs> and all kinds of uh, uh, poultry? Well, this, this is another one of our innovation. Uh, you know, as I've come and explained in the previous segments, uh, we are, you know, developing a whole slew of solutions utilizing coal as a starting material through a biotechnology. And, and one of the product uh, we are currently, you know, uh, helping out there in the you know, poultry industry to, you know, keep these uh, turkeys, uh, you know, happy while they are, you know, growing as well as keep them from disease free uh, and then decrease the antibiotics, uh, you know, use because today they, you know, we're growing large amount of these uh, poultry, you know, uh, turkeys and chickens in a very congested large areas. And now, looking at this, uh, one of the things, and actually you mentioned a couple of things that most people would not think about, is that, you know, people go to the grocery store and they just select whatever they is, you know, depending on the season. Uh, chicken, of course, is very popular uh, right. all seasons of the year. Turkey at uh, special times and also becoming uh, more popular. Uh, but this whole thing of using antibiotics is becoming a real challenge as far as human health is concerned and that's getting into the waste stream and then of course we're generating uh, millions literally of tons of extra animal waste all over the planet that's now working its way into the aquifers uh, the uh, open surface water and uh, drying and actually getting into the air so what is, what are you doing as far as your company is concerned to address these issues as we move towards 2050 and we're doubling and tripling the amount of animal proteins are being used in people's diets well you know to meet uh, today's you know large growing need for this animal protein uh, as I indicated you know all of these uh, uh, you know, turkeys and chickens are being grown in a almost what we call a production factories. Mm -hmm. You know, they are like, you know, you grow chicks or, you know, uh, and then, you know, up to certain age and then you, you know, take them into a large poultry house, you know, in a complete uh, close quarters and, and you provide them certain feed and then, you know, there is it in case of turkeys, that, that's where one of our primary focus is at present. It's a 20 week life, you know, cycle. Mm -hmm. And during that time, you know, they are given uh, food as well as a, you know, uh, in a number of, of course, you know, they are uh, growing in their own, you know, litter. Litter is a, you know, the wood shavings on which they are growing and their, you know, urine and their feces. Mm -hmm. And that's, really, you know, producing ammonia. So, you know, a lot of uh, requirements are now, you know, on these poultry houses that they must keep the ammonia level low. Mm -hmm. 
At the same time, you know, a lot of diseases happen. And so a lot of these turkeys uh, get, you know, uh, uh, certain diseases, uh, mm -hmm. dermatitis and other things. So they use a number of antibiotics and they're not working. Now look at this uh, chart. Tell us what we're looking at here and why is this important, not just for the industry itself, but we're really looking at the consumers all over the planet that are consuming more and more of this animal protein and the direct link between the litter, the waste of course, and the antibodies and the the flavor and the nutrition of the meat itself. Well, you know, what, what you're seeing on this chart is really our kind of the overall, you know, coal biorefinery approach, which I've come and explained in previous shows, but essentially, you know, we take coal and produce into energy and, you know, and uh, non-energy products. So one of the product is, of course, being used in the poultry industry. And, and uh, it's become a big issue, you know, as you indicated in, a, in, a, in your opening statement that uh, with the, you know, the economic well-being of the world populations increasing, they are, incre you know, consuming more and more animal protein. So uh, now to produce these large and at a very, very low cost, you know, they have to be almost like in a production factories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, a lot of the use of the antibiotics uh, is leading to a lot of concerns. At the same time, you know, they're not really solving the problem. So there's a, a term called culling. If certain number of uh, turkeys, you know, uh, after it, at, they are being examined at different stages of their growth, and if they have certain diseases, they have to be sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so they have to be killed. And uh, so there's a big loss. And so the turkey industry or the poultry industry operates with a very, very, very tight economics. Mm -hmm. And, and they have to be very you know, cost conscious, but they have to comply with many, many regulations. Mm -hmm. So they are very much open to new ideas. And we introduced this product made from coal. It's an you know, eco-friendly product, which is helping them to overcome multiple issues. Now tell us about this uh, eco-friendly uh, product, because most people say coal is the least <laughs> friendly thing on the planet, because you hear about you know, pollution, and of course right, this is right. in the power plants in China, the United States, and uh, many other countries. But yet, you have a whole new process, that is and you're not. You don't even have to mine it, if I understand exactly well, what it is a, you do. Is tell us, tell us about it. Well, again, you know, we have these microbes which uh, have come out of the termite guts, and they are, you know, we are utilizing those to convert coal into gas as well as into organic uh, humic product, which is an organic humic product is the uh, same thing as in the soil organic matter, mm -hmm. and from that product we make a multiple, you know, products which are currently being. Uh, uh, you know, used worldwide uh, in many, many applications, and it's a safe. So one of the product which you just put our label on, uh, on, on your screen is EctoCleanse. You know, this is a, what we call a general purpose industrial cleaner. And this product has been proven to be able to overcome, you know, number of issues in the poultry houses. And, and, and now some, what are some of those issues? We, we enumerated some of those earlier, but now that we have this uh, direct link as right. far as the product, what are some of the things you're addressing with this particular okay. product? Num number one issue is a, that, as I indicated, you know, when these uh, turkeys or even chickens, when they are grow, you know, being uh, raised in an in a enclosed, you know, uh, you know, these poultry houses, uh, you know, there's excessive amount of ammonia builds up. And the regulation, of course, ammonia is not only discomfort to the human beings, but also it's a uh, very discomfort to the animals. So they, the regulation required, at least in the USA, they should be below 125 parts per million. Mm -hmm. So these numbers can go up into much higher numbers. Uh, so one, uh, one of the application of this product is when you apply it to the litter, it eliminates uh, any of these chemicals which form urea. At the same time, this product uh, also helps in eliminating the pathogens which are in the litter. So when you uh, take your chicks into the poultry houses, they have now an environment where ammonia is uh, within acceptable range, and also the pathogens have been eliminated, and, and they require lesser of uh, use of the antibiotics. Now, I understand that there's a, a, a dramatic decrease in the amount of anti antibiotics that's needed uh, for the poultry farms if they're using this kind of product. Talk about that relationship and what is the actual decrease? And then, if I can add to that question, is that what does that do as far as the weight gain as far as the the poultry itself. Well, you know, uh, our product is currently being, uh, you know, used in uh, states like in North Carolina, in uh, down South Carolina, in Ohio, Michigan, 
uh, you know, uh, Arkansas and uh, Minnesota and many, many places. We have a really one of the most uh, industries experienced individual, Dr. Ball. He's working with us. He's a veterinarian uh, by education and he has, uh, you know, been involved with the turkey industry for a number of years. Uh, unfortunately, he is not here today. He's uh, traveling you know, overseas. Uh, but based on his number of uh, applications and working with the, you know, the veterinarians in this industry, what we are seeing is a, that there is a, you know, this 20-week life cycle I told you from the chicks to the 50 pound of the desired weight for the turkey before it goes into the further processing for the market. You know, we're seeing a, a decrease in usage of the, in some cases, a, a, you know, complete uh, no break uh, through of any of these diseases. Uh, in some cases, so it's a hundred percent decrease right, as far as diseases, in, and also then you can eliminate the uh, ammonia uh, antibiotics yeah, as well. Right, but it's not a those are very expensive. It is, yes, yeah, uh, antibi and not only they're expensive, but they're not working, and that's one of the big challenge. You know, like in our human beings also, that yeah. a lot of antibiotics are no. Well, they're saying that now is actually a direct uh, causal relationship with human beings because right. uh, you're, the mutation. We're using so many of the anti antibiotics that is, that is no longer working as far as humans concerned, right. regardless of what maybe the illnesses right, be. Right. Yeah, it has to be a total systems approach. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no one product which can come. You know, there's a total uh, approach. With Dr. Ball, you know, then helps uh, advised based on you know what their current operations are, how they are, uh, you know, uh, what kind of uh, you know system they have, and how they apply. So we are you know closely working with each of these places to make sure that uh, that it's a total systems approach mm -hmm. and that really I'm quite uh, pleased with the, the progress I've seen I was myself at uh, North Carolina's turkey industry conference uh, you know a couple of weeks ago and uh, so looking at this this is something I wanted to get to we're almost running out of time but tell us quickly what what is the show well what you're seeing in this is a chart of uh, the ammonia formation so when this product is applied initially you know whatever uh, the ammonia level goes up because uh, this product uh, completely breaks down the precursors of ammonia chemicals mm -hmm. and then you open up the poultry houses and it comes down and you can see that over extended period of time the ammonia level is below 25 parts per million. Oh, that's absolutely the same incredible. thing this uh, second chart is showing. Well, we've actually uh, run out of time, but I always ask this question, what do you see for Arctech over the next 5, 10, 15 years? Well, got to be quick. I, I see Arctech to continue to innovate, continue to prove out its products and uh, offer a, a solution using coal as a way forward. That's fantastic. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Damon Walia, who is the president and CEO of Arctech Inc. Washington, D.C. Thank you for being with us. And thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. I need a job. Necesito trabajo. I would like to speak English better. Me gustaría hablar inglés mejor. I want to be a U.S. citizen. Quisiera ser ciudadano de los Estados Unidos. For over 35 years. Por más de 35 años. The Hispanic Committee of Virginia has been serving our community. El Comité Hispano de Virginia ha estado sirviendo a nuestra comunidad. Job training and placement. Capacitación. Ayuda para conseguir trabajo. Education for children and adults, Educación para niños y adultos, immigration, naturalization, and medical referrals, Ayuda para los procesos de inmigración y naturalización y orientación sobre médicos, are a small part of what we do. Son solo una pequeña parte de lo que hacemos. For help, information, or to volunteer, para ayuda, información, o para ofrecerse como voluntario, contact the Hispanic Committee of Virginia. Comuníquese con el Comité Hispano de Virginia. Helping everyone participate more fully in American society. Ayudando a todos a participar plenamente en la sociedad norteamericana. Did you notice if you were missing half your kidney function? According to the National Kidney Foundation, 20 million people have chronic kidney disease and 20 million more may be at risk and not even know it. Anyone with high blood pressure, diabetes, or family history of chronic kidney disease is at risk. Early diagnosis is vitally important. To get the whole story, talk to your doctor and visit the National Kidney Foundation at kidney.org or call for a free brochure. 
because when it comes to chronic kidney disease, you might not know the half. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, and thank you for being with us. This is the Emerald Planet coming to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States. As we look for what we call the thousand best practices across 144 different nations around the globe. We're looking for what we call the best of the best as we make, it, make the uh, difference as we add two billion new people to the planet. And we're looking specifically at the whole industry of poultry. Uh, turkeys, uh, pheasants, chickens, all these things that go in and are almost universally used around the globe both as far as the meat of the poultry and the eggs and the other byproducts as well. We have someone uh, sitting right beside us who is an expert on this, has been uh, involved globally for a number of years. This is Dr. Damon S. Walia, who is the President and CEO of Arctech Inc., headquartered uh, in Washington, D.C. of the United States. And Dr. Walia, welcome back to the Emerald Planet. Well, thank you very much, Sam. It's always good to have you here. And every time you show up, even though we talk a lot, and I think I know everything you're doing, there's always something new <laughs> that keeps popping out. So tell us a little bit about what is Arctech, how it started, and then we're going to get into this whole thing as far as the waste and how you're addressing that and actually increasing the flavor, the nutrition, and the longevity of the poultry that's being raised for the market. Well, you know, Arctech has been a focused on, you know, developing solutions and deploying them, you know, and the solutions are, of course, based on utilizing coal as a starting material using a biotechnology approach as a way to produce clean fuel as well as uh, non-energy products, which are currently being used in multiple market applications. And, uh, you know, uh, we've now taken its applications into the, into the poultry and the animal industry, you know, dealing with a number of issues. Uh, that's what I hope I can communicate as to how this can be done. Well, you're doing a very good job of that. And let's go right into this because I know that as far as the uh, poultry is concerned, this is really the fastest growing area of uh, various animal proteins uh, around the globe. And as uh, more nations become more affluent, uh, we can talk about the 54 nations of Africa, and we, they're growing, some of those countries are going very rapid rate, Latin America, Southeast Asia, and uh, more and more animal proteins are working its way into the diet as people become more affluent and more discretionary income. So looking at this, what is, it, is your connection with the poultry industry and also with the feedlots for cattle and uh, other kinds of animals? Well, you know, in uh, this particular application, uh, what we are addressing is a big issue about the animal manures because you know going back to historically you know we raised animals out in the fields and uh, you know the, whatever manure came it got spread out but now we are you know growing these uh, or, you know animals in uh, large congested you know feedlots we call them or poultry houses so the amount of manure which is being produced in a bond, some areas are huge humongous and yeah, I mean, it get, goes into actually uh, thousands of tons right. uh, on a year in some tons. of these, uh, these many uh, concentrated uh, right. animal Right, so, so worldwide this areas. has become a big issue, you know. And uh, So ha what are we looking at here? What's this, what, what, this chart? This what, is very what, complex. Yeah, no, well, it's really, you know, what I brought to bear here is a, a solution we had developed for the U.S. military to make this chemical from coal, which uh, we had shown that it can take, you know, bombs and explosives and, uh, and c completely destroy them and turn them into a useful organic fertilizer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we applied the same chemical to, uh, you know, variety of animal manures. They can be from cattle manure, they can be from chicken or pig manure and the, the chemical we call it a AHAX you know it's a chemical which is a highly alkalized form of our organic mm -hmm. humic material derived from coal and this has a ability to it's a single to, you know basically a two-step simple process essentially you take manure and you do the first step of mixing uh, manure into this chemical and it completely eliminates any odor pathogens mm -hmm. and uh, you know and uh, you know variety of other concerns and then well, you can turn this into a into an organic fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Well, this is something that's very important as more and more people are moving out into the suburbs. The population is growing from 
uh, a little over seven billion people now to nine billion people. So people are coming uh, closer and closer to the animals, right. and particularly these large feedlots. And so if you can re eliminate the malodor, but as far as the solid waste is concerned, what happens to that? Does that go back onto uh, the the grounds on the the farming areas and becomes uh, more of the fertilizer, or what? Yeah, what is happening to that? Right, because see, the manure is a very has a very useful nutrients in it. You know, certainly there is there is some nitrogen. There is you know other nutrients. Uh, which have been in the manure, but uh, but it has also these pathogens and odor-causing chemicals. So we have we destroy those, but we retain all the good stuff, and then we make into an organic fertilizer. Uh, this chart you know shows an actual results of a test with the chicken manure, where all the you know volatile fatty acids which cause you know offensive odor are completely eliminated when we you know treat with this chemical. Now when you're treating it, uh, what's the application process? It's a simple, you basically you need a, a, a tank and, and you put your manure and you you know meter in our chemical and it's a matter of you know in a few minutes it uh, completely eliminates the odors. Now is this something you're actually spraying on the manure or uh, uh, what what's the process? Well you, you mix it in a tank because we need to want to you know bring it in contact and it's a simple you know a, a, a tank reactor mm -hmm. uh, where you put your manure and you put this chemical and uh, you know, and it has a little mixer in it, stir it up and, uh, you know, in a few minutes, uh, its odor is gone, its pathogens are eliminated. And, and then that can then be uh, automatically then go to the fields? Well, it goes to the next step where we then, you know, neutralize it and then it goes into a, a you know, as an organic fertilizer. And this particular chart is showing its uh, results of a, its elimination of any inert material because a lot of manures do have certain inert, like in case of chicken, they feed uh, you know these uh, shells, mm -hmm. and and that comes out in the manure as an inert material. So this has a ability to break those down, not 100 percent, but completely, you know, to a almost a majority of it is now become water soluble. So in that, but then that augments also the nutrients is New, going into the soil yeah. and then can go for the plants. That's and they're going to go back. Right, right. So it's a kind of a continuous uh, loop in right, process. Right. What are we looking at? Here? Well, this is an example of a test done at Penn State. Uh, they wanted to test this chemical for, uh, you know, looking at its ability to remove the odor from the from the you know pig manure. Pig manure is a big issue, and uh, you know so they had set up a panel. Uh, and you know they, that's the only way you can test the odor is you actually sniff it, and uh, so based on you know different dosages, you know they tested and they found that at a, some given specific uh, app, you know dosage into the pig manure, it eliminates the odor. That's what now this done. is something uh, you know in many Asian countries, uh, China, Taiwan, Vietnam, many of these countries, you know uh, pigs are very popular. Right, right. So is this something that, that you're actually exporting then into? To these countries and using there. Well, what we are looking for is to a, a collaborative projects to you know in a, uh, where we can then deploy this technology uh, as a as a co-ops, and I'll explain to you. But you know th this technology approach really offers a way to actually make more money from the manure than you make it money from the meats. Now tell us about that. Well, That's an it, interesting process. Yeah, you're making it, more from the manure than the actual meat that you're selling into that, the marketplace. That is correct. Yeah. From a, for example, from a ton of manure, depending on this, you know, the source of the manure. I'm talking about chicken manure in this case. Uh, you'll make a, about you know roughly about a, you know 800 gallons of uh, very effective organic fertilizer, and our soils need it. It really helps to improve the agriculture productivity, improve the soil fertility, and you know, at an average wholesale price of this product at about three dollars a gallon, you're making about twenty-four hundred dollars from a ton of manure. And so, what what was considered a waste in the past now right. all of a sudden becomes a because, viable economic right, project. Right. right. Well, okay, see, currently the current approach is to spread this manure in a large concentration onto the soil, and it becomes a you know there's a limit. Government, at least in the USA, is setting limit as to when you can apply, how much you can apply. Mm -hmm. So, large amount of manure is continued to be a, a pose a big problem. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at the uh, the application process here, what are we looking at, and uh, what is the the reason for this types of spreaders. Okay, the, these are you know you, once you make the product, uh, it's in a liquid product, so you can spray it onto the soil and uh, spray it onto the plants, mm -hmm. and uh, this will then help to improve the soil fertility because the fundamental component in the product is the organic humic matter which we have derived from coal, 
but we have taken the nutrients out of the manure. So the combination of those two gives a very effective organic fertilizer. So you're actually, the, um, the nutrients you're extracting from the coal then, you're actually mixing it with the manure, right. and then that goes out into the fields to provide nutrients for the plants. That is correct. Which in turn then goes to feed the animals, and you're just continuing sure. this that whole, is correct. Yes. This whole yes. process. It's a total recycling approach as a way to overcome these issues which we are uh, still you know, grappling with. Now looking at the, uh, the large feedlots and also these large uh, poultry barns, what amount of uh, manure is actually being created, say, within localities and, say, the United States or other countries? Well, it, it's a, in the U.S., it's almost in a millions of tons. You know, here, right here in our, you know, eastern part of U.S. in Del Marva, uh, you know, there's a large poultry houses. And, and that's Turkey, Delaware, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia. Yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. in millions and millions of tons of this material, which is continued to pose problem and, uh, you know, continues to uh, you know cause a huge amount of environmental uh, degradation out there, and it just just continue on the process. Yeah, yeah this is an you know again application of this uh, product uh, which can be applied as a in, a in a tanker and you spray it onto you know wherever you need to apply. Mm -hmm. So now is this actually with? It looks like this is actually in a poultry shed itself. Right, right. Yeah, this this is a example of the uh, use in the port you know the in the poultry litter. Um, you know, again, where this can also help in overcoming the odor issues and other things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so this is, and then going back to our earlier conversation, this is a way to reduce the use of the antibiotics. Uh, it's a way to reduce the amount of ammonia and other uh, harmful uh, odors that are coming up out of the manure and the bedding itself, correct? Well, yeah, I mean, that really goes back to the, the earlier, pro you know, the, the product I explained to you, the EctoCleanse, that is a specifically, you know, has a right chemistry and right biochemistry with it to be able to overcome those issues. Yeah, and this is something that's just amazing when you look at the uh, the millions of uh, the right. poultry that are being uh, created on a day-to-day yep. -day basis. Mm -hmm. And of course, this is what's going into the food stream. And right. so your product then is really helping to improve a across many different factors that is as far as uh, the food chain is going on, you know, both here and around the globe. Right. So we're gonna go out with that because we're just out of time. What do you see for the growth of your organization in relation to the production of poultry and any type of animal proteins in the United States and around the globe. And we well, have about 15 seconds. Well, this is a, something new uh, application we've just introduced in the last couple of years. So we already are very happy to see the, the acceptance and the response, and we see a big growth. And we're hoping to take these solutions into the other countries okay. so they can start well, this is Dr. Point. Damon Wally, President and CEO of Arctech Inc., as we create the Emerald Planet. turn my child's public school into a whole new kind of school. One with a curriculum that really motivates kids. One that has extended hours, six days a week, year round. With loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. One that has support services, like medical and dental, right there. A school where parents' involvement is encouraged. Where teachers have more time to teach. And students are excited about learning. There's just one problem. My child doesn't ever want to come home. You can help turn your school into a community school for excellence. Find out how. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. It's coming right to your neighborhood. And when it does, you may be surprised. It's your social security statement of your benefits, and it's going to help you plan your financial future. Your benefit statement will tell you how much social security you're eligible to receive, and when you'll get it. Then, you'll know how much you need to save for retirement, because that's coming too. The future is in your hands. Choose to save. The toxic fumes from this meth lab are seeping into Jamie's sinus cavity. Ammonia vapors invade her throat. Toxic gases fill her lungs. Jamie's body is deteriorating. And she doesn't even know it. Jamie, dinner. So, 
Who has a drug problem now? Find out how meth affects you at drugfree.org. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we uh, come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe and 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And so as we look at the production of uh, new animal proteins as citizens in the continent of Africa, all 54 nations, Latin America, Southeast Asia, the Pacific, are all looking towards animal proteins to improve the quality of life, the variety for their food. How are we going to be able to produce that and at the same time provide the quality that's needed without having the solid mass loading on the environment? And so this is a very delicate balance that we have to bring about. And at the same time, how can we use the waste that's being generated by these billions of poultry and livestock to produce energy? And we have a gentleman sitting right beside us that's uh, working on this uh, project and actually is already doing it. I shouldn't say just working on it. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Haug is the Chief Executive Officer of TRIA Systems and a good friend of his and a colleague, uh, Art Lazaro, has been a friend and on Emerald Planet a number of times. And Chris, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Thank you, Sam, very much for having us. And tell us about, we got TRIA here. Uh, this is a very pastoral scene. Tell us about TRIA. And then uh, we'll get into the specifics of the energy and production. Well, TRIA's mission is to discover and commercialize uh, highly disruptive and game-changing technologies that conserve energy and reduce pollution uh, for the betterment of society as a whole. Now, looking at this farm scene, I mean, this uh, looks, uh, you know, ideal. It's a, a wonderful place to be out in the countryside. But yet, you know, farms, even though they look very quaint and uh, very classical, actually, uh, this is really the hotbed of innovation and development in many of these properties. And I know that uh, through TRIA, you're actually leading that charge. So you know, some of these uh, different technologies that you have and some of the different impacts that you're having as far as agriculture is concerned? Well, the first technology that we're uh, in the process of commercializing, as a matter of fact, it's out on the market right now, is attempting to deal with the incredibly high energy costs that are facing uh, today's farmers. The historical paradigm in the farming community, when farmers need heat, they would burn propane. Propane's a fossil fuel. As a fossil fuel, you're talking about price volatility, availability, shortages, et cetera. And money. And money, yeah, a lot of money. And a farmers, money. Uh, you know, this is one of the things, uh, you know, having a ranch and a farm of my own for uh, many, many years, you know, fuel is a huge cost. If you think back to just about a year ago, when we went through the polar vortex, we saw propane prices go from an average of about $1.90 a gallon to over $5 a gallon, which created some absolute shortages in some areas of the Mid-Atlantic. And there were certain poultry producers that had to shut down because they couldn't heat their houses. Mm -hmm. Now, looking at this, you're looking at the waste uh, becoming a useful product. Tell That's us correct. about that, because most people think waste is a waste, but you're saying, no, it's not. It actually you're, can become a very useful product. You're absolutely right. What we're doing is we're taking animal manure and the natural biochemical process of composting. Composting pr produces an incredible amount of heat that is just wasted into the atmosphere. We're taking that heat, extracting it, running it through our system, and then giving it back to the farmer for his on-farm uses. And in doing so, we're able to save the farmer up to 75% 
of his energy costs on a net basis. Oh my goodness, that's incredible. Actually, I've been, uh, I guess I inflated a little bit. I've been telling people you're saving them 80%, so I'll have to uh, revise down to 75%. We want to stay in I, there. I, I don't want to get too ambitious too quickly, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> but anyway, looking at this, uh, looking at the poultry uh, sheds that we have here, and then uh, taking that uh, waste and then uh, going into growing the organic materials. Tell us about this process and how does that work and how is that actually addressing the issues as far as the environment is concerned? Well, with our process, um, we are not combusting any material. Therefore, we are not like a fossil fuel. With a fossil fuel, you have a variety of off gases, mm -hmm. CO2, carbon monoxide, ver various volatile organic compounds. We have none of those as a, as a byproduct of our process. It's 100% natural, it's 100% organic, and what, you, and what the farmer gets out of it at the end of the process is very, very rich, valuable compost. Yeah, and this is something that's going to go right back into the soils. Now, we have these uh, two uh, images here, one with, uh, you know, the poultry at the top, and then we have, you know, this incredible green scene. So what's the, the direct relationship here? Well, we are focused on two, two markets. One are what are known as confined animal e uh, feeding operations, or CAFOs. Right now, there are about 330,000 farms in the U.S., 330,000 farms? Thousand farms. That's incredible. And, and with about 8.8, 8.9 billion head of livestock. You know, that's all forms of livestock. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the other side, and this is something people don't know, is that the horticulture floriculture industry has 22,000 farms and 828 plus or minus million square feet of growing space under glass. Mm -hmm. All of that has to be heated, and all of that is being heated right now by propane. So great cost uh, using a fossil fuel, and then instead of using something that's a byproduct as far as the livestock process is concerned, because again, the world is eating more and more animal proteins. Mm -hmm. Many people saying we need to switch to uh, vegetables, nuts, and uh, 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 grains. But uh, many people want animal proteins because uh, 200 years ago, that's how most of the developing world started, and that's continuing. So looking at the scene, what's the juxtaposition here between these two? Are you actually taking this waste from the poultry and it's going into producing the organic uh, greens that we're seeing below? Well, no, they're, they're actually mutually exclusive. What we're targeting here are two distinct markets. I see, okay. okay. Um, you know, as an example, um, in both of the, in, in those two markets, you're talking about those two markets or those two segments combined burning over two billion gallons of propane annually, mm -hmm. at a cost of approximately six billion dollars. That's real money. A year. That's real. That's money. real money. Um, in addition, all that combustion is putting off about 15 million tons of CO2 or carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. That's the fallacy of propane. Mm -hmm. And what we're attempting to do is to eliminate a substantial portion of all of that. Okay, but you know I'm not gonna let this uh, these two images rest because That's okay. what you're telling me is, is that you're actually taking the waste and then it's going, it can go over into the vegetables uh, as, a, uh, as a organic material to correct. grow the vegetables, correct? Correct, okay. that's correct. So that's, this is the link that I wanted to, uh, us to make sure that we uh, go over. Okay, looking at these uh, confined uh, animal operations, they're everywhere now. Malodor is a real problem mm -hmm. in many of the suburban areas. People move into places, they know the animals are there, but once the humans are there, they no longer want to have the animals around. So what are you doing to address all of this? Well, the, you know, the chart that you see up there are what we have identified as being the major CAFO uh, geographical regions, and that's where we are going. Um, what we are attempting to do is, again, we're attempting to take, uh, what our motto is this, we want to take the farmer's greatest liability, which is his animal manure, mm -hmm. and turning it into a money-saving, revenue-generating asset for him, mm -hmm. which has really never been done before. 
uh, because there's just such incredible economic potential that exists within a resource that everybody has just kind of has looked at as waste. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and looking at these uh, confined animal feeding operations, why are there so such confinement? You know, this is an ongoing debate, you know, among environmentalists and uh, people in the organic farming, you know, this uh, uh, farm to uh, fork mm -hmm. uh, concept, range fed cattle. Mm -hmm. This is entirely different. This is, but it's a byproduct of what the uh, of what we as the consumer have have been asking for for decades, mm -hmm. and that is we want more food and we want better food, but we aren't willing to pay for the cost associated with doing it on a more organic or a more natural basis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in order to feed seven billion people today we have to have production farming. Now, do I, do I agree with 100% uh, with all the, um, all, all the issues that go on on a production farm? Maybe not. But by the same token, if we don't have production farms right now, we won't have the food that we need to feed 7 billion people in this world, let alone 9 billion people by 2050. Yeah, and that's what we're going to have. And if you look at the end of the century, they're talking about maybe another uh, 12 to 13 uh, billion people will be on. Uh, on the planet at that time. So, I mean, that's just an incredible uh, number of people and we have to take care of those. So looking at the technology that you've developed through uh, TRIA, how are you addressing this? I know you're trying to lower the cost of the farmer. You're trying to have a better product for the farmer, you know, reduce as far as the, uh, the fossil fuels are concerned. And then uh, turning, I, I assume you're turning this uh, manure into another useful product, which is, goes to uh, graze the plants. So how does all this process work and, and how does uh, TRIA make sure that you're going after both of these marketplaces and at the same time meeting the demands as far as the end user of these products? Well, one of the big drivers behind the uh, looming uh, food crisis is going to be um, developing more food with less arable land, um, more food with uh, uh, less water. There's going to be an incredible increase in environmental and, en and energy regulations. And um, as a result, what we're trying to do is play our part in lowering the farmer's on-farm cost. You've got to remember, when you're dealing in a production environment, a typical poultry farmer or swine farmer, you're talking about a profit in hundreds of cents of a, you know, a pound. So if we're So it's very low. Incredibly low. That's incredible. And we're almost running out of time. we got about 30 seconds. What do you see for the future of uh, TRIA over the next 5, 10, 15 years? In about 15 seconds. Well, my goal for TRIA is that we are going to be an international organization solving not only fundamental problems in agriculture in the United States, but around the world. That's fantastic. It's a great answer. Glad to have you here. And thank you for being with us, uh, dear viewer, as we look at the future of poultry, future of food on the planet as we create the Emerald Planet. Some dreams are universal. Dreams that inspire us. Multiple sclerosis is a devastating disease that changes lives forever. The National MS Society does more for people with MS than any organization in the world. But we can't do it alone. To get involved, visit us online at nationalmssociety.org or call 1-800-FIGHT-MS. This is why we're here. Because nobody dreams of having multiple sclerosis. What's wrong with this picture? Half of young Americans can't locate economic powers like Japan and India. 20% can't even find the Pacific Ocean. Without geography, our children aren't ready for the world. Geography is everywhere. It's incredible creatures. Rhythm, fashion, flavor. 
It's economics and politics. It's change. Understanding connections between people and places is critical in the 21st century. That's why we created MyWonderfulWorld.org. Go there now for your free parent and teacher action kits and give our kids the power of global knowledge. Because kids who understand our world today can succeed in it tomorrow. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello, my name is Dr. Sam Hancock. I'm the President and Executive Director of the Emerald Planet and also the producer and director and host of the Emerald Planet TV. And we'd like to thank you for being with us on a week-to-week -week basis as we talk about the what we call the best of the best, the best technologies and the best practices and also the technologies, the products and the services as we look around the globe in 144 different nations. And as we add another 2 billion people to the planet by 2050 and then possibly another 5 billion at the end of the century, how are we going to be able to provide the food, the fuel, the fiber, everything that's needed uh, for these humans. And uh, we have somebody, uh, Chris Hauk, is a Chief Executive Officer of TRIA Systems in uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, Chris, I know you've been working on these issues and we're really going to keep two different tracks. One is extracting the energy as far as the manure, the waste that's coming from the animals. And then there's something that you're working on called Quick Wash. Correct. So uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, TRIA Systems, a little background, and uh, what do you see for uh, as it moves forward as we go towards uh, 2050? And then let's deal with the, the waste issues and then how we're going to be able to take all that and do it and so it reduces the cost to the farmers but increases a better quality product to the consumer. Well, thank you, Sam. Um, TRIA Technologies is, is a, a technology commercialization company and we're focused on bringing to market technologies that are fundamentally disruptive in the agriculture industry, specifically around energy conservation and uh, nutrient pollution reduction. Now we hear a lot about uh, disruptive technologies and it's almost becoming a catchphrase. What is a disruptive technology and how does TRIA fit into that whole schema of bringing more of these disruptive technologies to the marketplace? Well, in, in, I, th I think a lot of people will have a lot of different answers to that question, but my definition is this, and that is a disruptive technology is something that is presented into the marketplace that fundamentally changes the entrenched paradigms that have existed within that market or that industry for tens, fifteens, twenties, 20 years or more. Mm -hmm. it, it fundamentally takes and changes the, the here and now and the future and turns it on its head. Yeah, and this is something that uh, as the uh, world, and we this is almost a contradiction when you have people going to bed uh, hungry at night, but uh, people are becoming more fluent. They're using more animal proteins uh, into their diet because they feel this is the best way to get it. They like the taste and they uh, like the traditional nature of uh, animal proteins, but yet we're generating you know billions of uh, pounds almost billions of tons of waste on an annualized basis and so we have this waste but yet what you're doing is you're taking that and turning it into something that's very positive and so what is that uh, product that you're actually taking out of this waste well we have two products uh, the first one is what we call our biomass HRS which stands for heat recovery system where we are taking the farmer's uh, single greatest liability, his manure, and we're turning it into a money-saving revenue generating asset. And how we're doing that is we're composting that animal manure or other organic material. Mm -hmm. The process of composting generates incredible amounts of heat. We're capturing that heat 
processing it and giving it back to the farmer for his on-farm uses and in the process saving him approximately 75 percent of his on-farm energy costs. Yeah. And we talked about that before that's an incredible amount of savings and when you're looking at a farmer they have very thin margins anyway in some years losses. Correct. And uh, that's uh, something that we really have to be cognizant of. Now looking at this nitrogen and phosphorus what's going on here and what's the impact on the environment from all of this waste and how does your process helping to allow some of that uh, impact or this waste loading on the environment. Well, now we're now we're getting into talking about the the second technology that we're bringing to market, and it's a technology that we have licensed out of the USDA. It's a patented process. The USDA is uh, United States Department of Agriculture. Okay. Uh, it's a patented process, and it's a simple, straightforward process that will remove and recover. And there's a big distinction there between remove and recover mm -hmm. up to 90% plus of the phosphorus in animal manure. Why is that such a big deal? Well, for those who are living on the East Coast and are familiar at all with the Chesapeake Bay, the single largest problem with the Chesapeake Bay is nutrient pollution. Mm -hmm. And that's being caused by phosphorus and nitrogen, primarily phosphorus. Those who are around the country may remember what happened in Toledo this summer where for about 10 days, the entire city of Toledo had to shut their uh, domestic water uh, uh, system down because of toxic algae blooms. What caused them? Phosphorus pollution. Where did the phosphorus come from? Animal waste running off into the waterways. So if this is such a huge problem, uh, why are uh, uh, cities, counties, states, uh, even the United States <clears throat> itself allowing these large uh, animal operations then to continue to exist if it has that kind of negative impact on the environment? Well, uh, because you're, you're dealing with a very, very delicate balance between being able to feed not only the United States, but the world, mm -hmm. and do so in such a way that it is as cost effective as possible, while at the same time trying to rein in and control all of the other detrimental uh, elements associated with factory production, arable land, water, water quality. Uh, you know, energy usage and carbon emissions, etc. Yeah, and so we're looking at this. Really, it's the, this very careful, delicate balance between the environment and the economy that we have to be cognizant of. Because if we add these two billion new people, they have to work somewhere. They have to have something to eat. We have to do all these kinds of things. And it sounds like what you're doing is you're getting a head start on this as we're ramping up towards uh, 2050, which is kind of the tipping point for these two billion new people on the planet. Correct. Right now, in the United States alone, we produce about 1.7, we don't, but the animals produce right. about 1.7 billion tons of manure a year. Contained in that is 102 million plus or minus tons of nitrogen and phosphorus. There's a study that says that if we could recover 70% of the phosphorus that's in animal manure, we could replace the need to import 30% of the phosphorus that's currently coming from Sub-Sahara Africa. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of difference that we, we would like to make. Mm -hmm. And also, too, that would eliminate the uh, use of uh, crude oil as far as producing uh, chemical fertilizers as well. So that's another way of uh, addressing that. Quick watch, tell us a little about this. And what's the role of USDA, the United States Department Department of Agriculture, you know, working with a, a private company. The, the federal <clears throat> government and USDA in particular has a very, very healthy, aggressive program of taking technologies that are developed within their labs and their research facilities and partnering mm -hmm. with private firms to help move those technologies into the marketplace mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. Quick wash is a three-step process, and it goes through and we, we extract the phosphorus out of the manure and out of the manure solids. Then we turn around and we chemically treat it and precipitate that phosphorus out as calcium phosphate cake. Mm -hmm. What you get out of this process is three, by, three very valuable byproducts. High quality calcium phosphate cake. We remove 85 to 95 plus or minus uh, percent of it and capture it as calcium phosphate. Mm -hmm. 
you get what, what are known as conditioned manure solids, which when they are composted, become EPA class A uh, manure solids, which in essence, you can, you can spread anywhere for anything, which is, an, which is another source of potential revenue. The third is a balanced nutrient liquid fertilizer, which is the process water that comes off the quick wash process. We can take that, we can custom design that to meet specific nutrient needs, and then that can be sold anywhere where, where, where fertilizer is needed. And so this is another revenue stream as far as the farmers are concerned. So they're taking a waste, turning it into a very useful product. Exactly. That actually gives them a, a diversification as far as income exactly. is concerned. Okay, looking at that, I want to go back to this extraction of the heat and allowing the uh, farmer to greatly reduce their use of propane and, mm -hmm. and all those other kinds of things. And so, uh, talking about this phosphorus and the nitrogen, all that you're extracting, but at the same time, you're actually pulling this heat off of the manure. And I understand, as you were saying earlier, Chris, that the, there's a very high level of heat you know, that's being generated through the manure. That's correct. In, in a well-designed, well-functioning compost system, um, your biochemical, your microbiological activity will produce temperatures of up to 180 degrees Fahrenheit for a period of six to eight weeks, depending on how you manage your compost and process. And that's like a life cycle then, of yes. six to eight weeks? Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, it, a little shorter, a little longer, depending right. on how you, uh, you know, how you manage the process. But that's 180 degrees Fahrenheit that heretofore has just gone into the atmosphere as waste heat. Mm -hmm. What we're doing is capturing that and being able to then put it, give it back to, say, a poultry farmer or a swine farmer for his grow out houses where he has to maintain 90 to 95 degree heat all the time in those houses. We're giving them free energy, virtually free energy. Mm -hmm. Now, in collaborating with the farmers, when you're going in and talking with the farmer and saying, hey, this is a, a new idea, new techniques, new process that can be used, what is, what is the typical reaction when you say, hey, we can reduce your uh, energy costs by maybe uh, 75%? The first thing out of their mouths is, you've got to be kidding me. The second thing out of your, their mouths is, okay, show me. The third thing out of the, their mouths is, I like it. Um, you've, got to, you've got to understand that the fundamental nature of the farming industry has changed over the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. the, and, and there's a generational cycle going on, and that is the younger farmers coming up today are highly educated, brilliant people with PhDs and master's degrees in science and engineering and agriculture. These guys know what they're talking about, and they are on the leading edge of innovation in the on-farm. And we're running out of time. Where do you see TRIA going over the next five, ten years? Well, we want, to, quick. we want to be an international company solving international problems. That's fantastic. Chris, thank you for being with us and uh, talking about all of this. It's just wonderful the work that you're doing and the fact you're uh, dealing with Art Lazaro I think is uh, a real plus. I just love the guy. He's a great fella. And thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet.